So, and thank you for joining us. This is our first event of the 2017-2018 academic year. This is also our first event for this year's National Endowment for Humanities colloquium series that we hold every year, thanks to an initial grant from the NEH in 2010. And the way this series works is faculty apply to be able to use a certain pot of money to schedule a year's worth of events, discussions, film screenings, exploring a particular topic of the or theme related to Holocaust, genocide, or mass violence. So this year, we were lucky enough to get, um, as our NEH KHC scholar in residence, Professor Azada Alai standing in the back. You'll hear from her in a minute. Um, from, uh, she's uh, an instructor of psychology in the social sciences department. And this year's theme is collaboration and complicity, as you will hear more. And this theme aligns very closely with this year's exhibit, which is gonna be launching two weeks from now, believe it or not. All there is is white and gray walls. But two weeks from today, we will have, or three, let's say, to be safe, um, our new exhibit up. And it's about um, a whole village of rescue during World War II, the village of Le Chambon and the surrounding communities in southern France, where about 5,000 Protestants saved somewhere in the range of 3,500 Jews and 1,500 other refugees for the entirety of the war. And it's a remarkable story. And our exhibit will tell that story. So please pick up one of our catalog of events. They're stacked in the back. It'll tell you our program series for the entire year. There's one other thing I want to mention for the students in the room. Friday is the last day to apply to be one of the center's fellows for this coming academic year, or for the semester, really. We have three fellowships that we're offering this semester. And at the end of each fellowship, if you complete it successfully, we do provide a stipend to students. The three topics we're exploring this year is the history of the Holocaust, at the end of which you will have the privilege to meet and interview Holocaust survivors. We have another fellowship that is following actually the collaboration and complicity events. So you can come to the entire series and in the middle we'll have conversation and discussion that'll help you think about it and become someone who could t teach others about it. And we have a third fellowship opportunity which is really more like an internship where you will be given projects and you'll be working on creating materials for this center about diversity, human rights, Holocaust, genocide, and other similar topics. So if you're interested, there will be flyers at the back about the fellowships with instructions on how to apply as well. We still have spaces, so I encourage you to apply. So without further ado, I would like to now introduce you to the NEH Scholar in Residence for the Kupferberg Holocaust Center this year, uh, Dr. Azada Alai. I'm glad I wore my heels today. Hi, everyone. Um, can everyone hear OK with the microphone? Yeah. OK, so um, I'm so excited to be here. This is launching the first of a number of events we'll be doing this semester, where we're going to be exploring this theme of complicity and collaboration, which you'll all learn a lot more about shortly. So I'm going to introduce our guest lecturer, Dr. Susan Backrack. But before we get there, just want to tell you a little bit of a backstory of um, why specifically I I decided to choose this theme. So um, every year when we do this project, the scholar in residence is basically tasked with, think about a focus or a perspective with which we'll introduce our students to the Holocaust. It's obviously a really um, complex historical event to try to unpack and understand. And a lot of times it helps if we find a particular framework or lens with which to understand it. And so, um, if you'll allow me for a moment to tell you a brief anecdote to kind of rewind back to um, several years ago, I was in the DC area and I was at um, a peace building and conflict resolution seminar. 
And as part of the seminar, we were in the nation's capital, we were going to a lot of museums, governmental buildings, you know, exploring different institutions that were promoting peace and conflict resolution in our society. And the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum was on our itinerary. And I was very excited for that because I do Holocaust-related research. And that was my first exposure to the exhibit that we're going to be exploring today, which is entitled Some Were Neighbors. So we got to the museum, we were on the floor where the exhibit was, and I remember just being absolutely mesmerized by this exhibit. I'm a social psychologist, and so I was really interested in unpacking and analyzing the Holocaust from the perspective of social psychology. And I was really in the early stages of my Holocaust scholarship. And so the Somewhere Neighbors exhibit really resonated with me because I felt like it gave this very relatable story about what the ordinary person on the grounds in the community um, can do, maybe should do, versus what they oftentimes do do when totalitarian regimes come into power. And it recognizes that these small decisions that we make as individuals, as community leaders, as um, local people, they can resonate and have a really large impact. So I found it very empowering. I found it very relatable. And several years later, when I had the opportunity to apply for this um, opportunity here with the series, I thought, well, we're going to explore complicity and collaboration. Um, you know, if I'm selected, this is really what I want to look at for the year. And so I really have to thank um, our speaker because it was her exhibit that she put together that was really the start for me of what I hope to be a book and a big research project that I'm doing now. So without further ado, I want to introduce our speaker. Um, she is the longtime curator of uh, special exhibits at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. And this is in Washington, D.C. She received her PhD in modern European history from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and she's curated a wide number of um, very compelling exhibits at the museum. But the first one that um, she worked on, which is one of the most iconic ones if you ever go to this museum, is the, um, the, the ID. The, the permanent exhibition of the identity cards. So I'm gonna read you a brief description from um, the Holocaust Memorial Museum's website. Anyone with a show of hands who's been there before? Who's actually, yeah, okay, more than I would have thought. Yeah, so for those of you who visit DC, if you get the opportunity, um, it's a very, very um, wonderfully developed and um, just, it's, it's a must see in terms of all the museums that are in DC. So this is their description of this um, identity cards um, development. So visitors to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum's permanent exhibition receive ID cards chronicling chronicling sorry I can't pronounce that the experiences of people who lived in Europe during the Holocaust. These cards are designed to help personalize the historical events of the time. Each ID card has four sections. The first provides a biographical sketch of the person. The second describes their indi the individual's experiences from 1933 to 1939. And the third describes events during the war years, which starts in 1939. The final section describes the fate of the individual and explains the circumstances to the extent that it's known about essentially whether they survived or died during the war. So it's a really personal way to experience the Holocaust from the perspective of you follow this one person's story and you try to kind of anticipate whether or not they survived or where they ended up, for instance. And it's, it's one of the really memorable pieces of um, going to that particular museum. And the first position that Dr. Bachrock had was working on the ID cards project. It's one of the most memorable features of the museum. She's also overseen a lot of other exhibits. I'll just mention a few of them. We were talking earlier um, before we started, Deadly Medicine is one of them. For those of you who are nursing students, you've probably read um, some of the literature from, from this. It's looking at the creation of the quote unquote master race. Um, Liberation 1945, Nazi Olympics Berlin 1936, Oscar Schindler, An Unlikely Hero, 
And she's also published books, including Tell Them We Remember, The Story of the Holocaust and the Nazi Olympics, Berlin, 1936. I would also like to add that our esteemed speaker is presently serving as the lead historian on the museum project to revitalize the 25-year-old permanent exhibition. And this is actually going to involve um, incorporating themes related to complicity and co collaboration. So please join Join me in welcoming our guest lecturer to QCC, Dr. Susan Backrack. Thank you so much for that very nice um, introduction, and thank you all for coming. Um, happy to see you here today on this gorgeous day. Um, can everyone hear me? I am very soft spoken. <laughs> Sorry. Um, when individuals encounter the history of the Holocaust in all its um, vivid details and vast dimensions, I think a lot of us say, you know, how was this possible? How could something like this have happened? Um, and part of the answer to this question, usually people will say if they know anything about the topic, it's all about Hitler, the Nazis, that, that's a standard answer, right? Um, and it's a very easy answer because that distances us self from the topic. We, you know, we're not going to be like, like them. Um, but part of the answer to this question is because of the roles played and the choices made by ordinary people like, like us. Ordinary people, human beings like you and me. Um, human beings like those shown in the title image, oops, there. Um, this is actually a photo that shows um, the man in uniform is a uniform uh, policeman, a member of the Gestapo. Um, but the people in the foreground, the mostly women in this case, are um, Jewish residents of this community and nearby communities who are being deported. It's wartime, 1940. Uh, Germany has conquered neighboring France. And this town is located on the border. And um, a lot of the Nazi leaders in this area, they want to basically cleanse their towns of Jews. So these are some of the first deportations. This is before the killing began. And these um, Jewish ladies, and there are some men too, and a few children, a lot of children have been um, sent abroad um, to England and other places if possible, um, are going to be sent into France. And then um, they're, they're going to be um, transferred to French policemen, a story that we'll pick up later on. But you can see the, the neighbors, the people hanging out from the balcony there, looking what's going on. You can see some children peeking through. This was a small town. A lot, a lot happened in this town. So an event like this became a big spectacle. And this image is actually one of about um, 20 images that kind of show step by step the removal of these um, civilians who didn't do anything from this community after they have been required to turn over the keys to their apartments and houses and leave most of their belongings behind that have now become the possession of the state. And they're allowed to take very what they can carry, basically. OK. The subtitle, we, so some of these people may have been neighbors. Uh, the subtitle, Collaboration and Complicity in the Holocaust. What, what do these terms mean? These, these are kind of abstract, but since this is a colloquium on this topic, I think it very briefly, before I get into the content, I, I, I think it would be good to talk about a few definitions. You know, collaboration, we usually think of that as a very positive thing. If we, we're collaborating with our friends, with our fellow students, um, our fellow citizens, but during World War II, collaboration took on a different kind of negative connotation, and it meant helping, in this case, 
the enemy in countries like France, uh, which was occupied, um, or in countries of Eastern Europe. What about complicity? Complicity. C can anyone, student, tell me here what it means to be complicit, what they think it means to be complicit? Somebody give me a, a kind of a definition. Anybody want to make a stab? What about you? No? Someone be brave. Not, not, not putting up a fight, not resisting, going along? Not speaking up for the right. Okay, not speaking up. Okay, it can, that's a very, very good um, kind of behavior where one can become complicit. And we actually hear a lot about complicity in the current climate, don't we? Um, it can cover a range of responsibility and a lot of gray areas, areas that aren't so black and white. That's really bad, that's really good, okay? People may be on the sidelines. And it, it becomes very, very important in terms of discussion of the Holocaust. Um, it's, it could be moral responsibility, not speaking up, but responsibility as a citizen, where you're not acting in a, in a civic manner and you're not showing some courage. Um, or it, sometimes it, it, it does cover legal, uh, being a, an accomplice in a legal manner. So it does cover a lot of, lot of different areas. But I think probably for this uh, colloquium, we're, we're more interested in the morality and ethics that are involved there. Um, just, I know a lot of you are young. A lot of you don't know, might not have uh, know the geography of Europe that well. And this was Europe at a time when the countries even were different than they are today. So we had something called the Soviet Union, um, which most of you, a lot of you here, not all of you, but some of you here, um, were born um, after the demise of the Soviet Union. I don't know how well you can see this, this map, but I just wanted to, to bring it up because it shows the extent of German rule of Europe during World War II at the height of German power. Look at that map and look at all those blue areas. Now, some of those blue areas in the south are countries allied with Germany, friendly to Germany, like Italy, um, Romania, um, Bulgaria, these are allies of Germany, Hungary, Slovakia is kind of a puppet. Um, but all of this part of Eastern Europe is now in, uh, I think this is around 1942, is Nazi ruled, under Nazi rule. It's huge, encompasses many uh, people speaking different languages. And this also happens to be, by the way, the area where the majority of Jews happen to live for historic reasons. They were crowded into this area. And this is where 75% of the victims are going to come from. Not from Germany, where by 1941, I think there were only 300,000 Jews left. So six million victims, they're gonna come but they're gonna come from all over Europe from countries that are controlled. So the Holocaust was an event certainly would not have happened without Hitler. No Hitler, no Holocaust, I think. Would not have happened without the Nazi leadership of Germany. In Germany, the Germans were the key perpetrators. But it involved many, many officials, leaders, and ordinary people in all these other countries, okay? So I'm gonna talk about um, some people who lived in Lithuania. That's to the northeast of Germany. It borders part of Germany. It became conquered by Germany um, in 1941. I'm gonna, um, so I'm also gonna talk about Belarus a little bit. This was part of the Soviet Union, um, but after the German invasion, 
um, it becomes German controlled territory. You know what I'm doing? I'm leaning, I'm leaning on this. It's bad. OK. With that little preliminary geographic lesson and definitions, now I'm going to go and I'm going to show you the uh, five-minute introductory film that we showed for our exhibition, Somewhere Neighbors, at the museum. By the way, it's still there, and it will be there until October 17th, if any of you get down there. Um, but this sums up some of the points I've made and, and helps frame the discussion today. So it's about five minutes. Some were neighbors. And among them was some of the people he went to school with, some of his best friends, the guys from the card club. And out of that crowd came a friend of my father. We were friends, I thought. This was a boy that grew up with me for 16 years, and he could do something like this. And that was my best friend. They were neighbors. The furniture and the glass was all in, in, in shadows. Everything was, my father's butcher store, the, the window was broken in and everything was demolished. And this was done by young people whom we knew. After the Holocaust, many survivors recognized the roles of Adolf Hitler and other true believers ideological hardliners who supported the Nazi party early on and who viewed Jews as biologically inferior. But how could so many ordinary fellow human beings, even people they knew, have betrayed them, taken pleasure in their persecution, benefited in some way from their misfortune? Before the Holocaust, Jewish life in Europe was diverse. In some places, especially in Central and Western Europe, many Jews were integrated into the larger society through school, the workplace, and other settings. In Eastern Europe, many of the millions of Jews who lived there resided in predominantly Jewish communities, meeting non-Jews through business and the marketplace. After the Nazis took power in Germany, the new regime's goal was to deprive Jews of their rights and livelihoods and force them to leave the Reich. During World War II, Germany conquered and directly ruled vast areas of Eastern Europe. The marking and isolation of Jews from non-Jews were first steps toward their destruction. German-ruled Eastern Europe became the main terrain for the mass murder of Jews by Germans and their collaborators, including many Jews who lived far away in countries allied with or occupied by Germany, whom collaborating police often assembled for transport to the east. One of the nastiest memories I have is getting going on that journey and people were lined up, up, up the stairs, up to the door of the apartment waiting to ransack whatever we left behind, uh, cursing at us, yelling at us, spitting at us as we left. The Holocaust would not have happened without centuries of the longest hatred, prejudices, discrimination, and attacks on Jews and Jewish property. Jews were a religious minority in largely Christian Europe. Other pressures and motives, ones that affect individuals in less extreme circumstances, also came to the fore. Fears and pressures in school, work, and the community, roles as students, teachers, workers, police, soldiers, neighbors, friends, influenced their choices to go along with their peers or to defer to authority, even when they had some moral qualms. This is the real truth. That was my girlfriend. We used to go to her together, have fun together, left to get before the the uh, 
the last test uh, before the graduation. We were studying together for nights and nights, and she did it to me, to us, to my family. Many individuals also succumbed to pressures, risks, and age-old temptations. While it might be comforting to think that people were simply forced to do what they did, or that they were even brainwashed, examples of individuals who did help those in danger prove that people did have choices, even in the face of great risks and temptations. So Leo had a great deal of um, our possession at that point. And we went to Leo for food. Now I must impress upon you as to, to the character of Leo. Leo already had all the stuff that he could ever get from us, except maybe for some land. And all he had to do is tell us to get lost and he would have never seen us again. He never did. He fed us all along. So I think that last quote is, is really key in, in one of the themes for our exhibition. And, um, you know, at crucial junctions, every individual makes decisions. Um, and, you know, sometimes we make the, the right ones. Sometimes these decisions are very, very hard ones. Um, and sometimes it's very, very hard to make them when the rest of the group that you happen to be part of is, is doing something else. In any case, so I don't know if you could read the text that was superimposed on some of these images talking about the other motivations and pressures that became involved. You know, anti-Semitism is part of the context, but it can't explain everything. Sometimes there were, were um, the, an awful lot is being done now about how people benefited from the plight of their neighbor, and they benefited in material ways. Um, and that last clip, I like so much, the man talking about Leo, um, it was very common in places like um, Poland. When Jews went into hiding, what they, did, what they would do to, to try to survive is to leave all their possessions with someone they thought they could trust, you know, Polish friend or neighbor. Um, and little by little, the possessions could be sold off on, on you know, for, to pay for food. And it was very tempting for people in the middle of a war when they're trying themselves to survive to just say, you know, get lost. I'm going to keep this stuff for myself. Um, and, you know, there's an example of someone who, who didn't do that and, and helped his friend and helped that his, the friend and his family to survive. Um, now, so being involved in, in events of the Holocaust, including events that led up, led up to the killing. It, can, it could include a whole range of things. And sometimes, as our exhibition shows, it, it by the way, this is the website. Um, you can access that video that I just showed. It's at http somewhereneighbors.ushmm.org Exhibition. I think Dan said that there's going to uh, be a link to the this on um, the Holocaust Center website here. Um, so, so sometimes, you know, doing this can be just about doing your your job, um, or at least that's what people said often after the war. They were just doing their duty. This uh, panel here, just doing my job is hiding um, a large photo of a customs official, a person who's overseeing the packing of a moving van in Bielefeld, Germany in 1936, before the war. Someone's leaving, someone's uh, getting out, and part of his job was to prevent the smuggling of valuables that law prohibited Jews from taking from the country. So you have to ask the question, was the custom official complicit in the persecution of the Jews? Um, were the tax offices who helped by banks who collected taxes on Jewish properties that was imposed on um, uh, Jews? 
um, as a way to deprive Jews of their assets. Um, here's the tax official and a form that was collected um, quarterly after Kristallnacht. These were violent attacks on Jews, no November 9th, 10th, 1938, really in some ways the beginning of the, the Holocaust. Um, and after it, the German leaders said that the Jews had to pay for all the property damages um, that had been perpetrated on them. So people had to um, compile a list of all their assets, um, you know, real estate, their belongings, and figure out basically, you know, what their worth was. And they were taxed 25% of that, sometimes 20% in quarterly payments. So the tax officials, under, in this case, under this person, Heising's direct, they filed, they processed these forms four times, um, not just once, but four times. Um, it's called a tax on Jewish wealth. Um, Heising, by the way, was very highly educated. He was trained at four different uh, universities. He never joined the Nazi party. Um, and after the war, he continued working in um, German, the new Ger federal Germany's tax offices. He continued his work. Um, and part of his job then was processing claims that Jewish survivors made to, to be in re reimbursed for seized property. This was the perfect career man. Um, was he complicit? Or was he simply doing his professional duty and following the law, as many civil servants said in Germany after the war? Another quick example of that, someone who's keeping track of where people live. That becomes really, really important, knowing where people lived after, um, since you need someone's address to be able to arrest them and take them away. These kind of this is very, very common in, in Europe that local communities have these kind of file registries. Um, that's why this has always been an issue in this country, by the way, in the protection of, of um, individual rights. Why? One reason why in the US there's been an effort to you know, fight having a, a national ID card. This information can sometimes be used for sinister purposes. Um, in fact, in Amsterdam during the war, there were members of the re Dutch resistance who destroyed these registries to try to help save people so they couldn't be rounded up. So this kind of information that may seem very mundane can be very, very important. And the clerks and the other officials involved in collecting it and keeping it, you know, they, 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 what is their level of, of involvement? Um, so the central role of Hitler and other Nazi party leaders is indisputable. Um, but there were many, many individuals in countries, not only Germany, but across Europe, who collaborated or were complicit in German Nazi crimes. Some were willing helpers, some simply benefited from the persecution of Jews, and others were in desperate situations themselves. Um, let's look at a different um, context, and, and this is, is a tough context. German occupied Eastern Europe in wartime. This was a climate of violence and terror, and it's close to the sites where Jews were killed. People knew what was happening in these, these places. So let's look at people in a small town. As I mentioned, this is in Lithuania. That's Eastern Europe, north by the Baltic Sea. How did they respond to the persecution of the Jewish neighbors? Um, Jews had lived side by side with their Lithuanian neighbors. These are some of the houses around the uh, market 
square in this town of Butramonas. There's, there's, these houses are still there today where um, Jews who were killed used to live. And as was very common in many of these um, Eastern European towns, um, Jews ran the shops, a lot of the small shops, and um, the farmers from you know, the area came in and, and they had relations. Everybody, and actually in this town, relations were very, very good um, before the war. So what happens after Germany invades Lithuania, it's right across the border, and occupies the country in the summer of 1941? Well, on one day, on September 9th, 1941, 740 Jews, 67 men, 370 women, and 303 children from this town and nearby towns were marched down a road, it's about a mile from this marketplace, and they were shot in, in farm fields, they were killed. It was a Nazi-led operation, the Nazi SS and German police led it, but Lithuanians participated, and they actually outnumbered the Germans five to one. Um, the local police chief, his men, and others long known to local Jews guarded the victims, and they also hunted Jews who tried to evade arrest. This is the site of the um, mass killings. Sometimes this is called the Holocaust by bullets, by the way. This is part of the Holocaust that's not very well known because most people think, you know, Jews are just put on trains and taken to gas chambers. But in fact, something like 1.5 million Jews were shot in face-to-face -face operations in hundreds of communities. Um, and so there was a lot of local involvement of different types. Um, in any case, and this is a memorial that has been erected at, at one of the um, mass grave sites. And this was during a visit that I made um, to re research this, this project. Okay, wait a minute. Oh, I'm not gonna be able to go back. Okay, I'm gonna... Um, if, if we could just pause that for a second. Um, so in Eastern Europe, as I said, there were many Jews living there. So there were, there were long and complex histories of anti-Semitism there. But a lot of other human motives and pressures, including things like greed and, and settling scores, and all these ordinary things that happens even in our lives, in much less extraordinary circumstances came into play. Um, so I'm gonna show you uh, an interview. The museum has done a very interesting series of interviews in Eastern Europe since uh, over the years, since the 90s. And these aren't with Jewish survivors. They are with witnesses who lived in these places and they're, they're talking in their native Languages. So this is subcaption. It's going to be a little hard to read. So I'm going to voice over if you can bear with me on that. But Victoria Pauxiana here is going to talk about what happened after her father, who was a farmer in the Butramonas region. He helped. He helped a group of Jews who were escaping, um, trying to to hide, and he was a rather well-off farmer. And he had some outbuildings on his property. And one of them, and remember in this very cold area in the winter, had a sauna building in it. So she's going to mention the sauna. Just to set this up a little bit. It turns out Victoria afterwards, she was very conflicted about what her father had done because of what happened to him afterwards. But so see if you can um, bear with me as I help you. Um, read the labels here, the subtitles.
Ну, а как вьюз голова, сколько я приема в жиду? Ну, по мейлею. Мотерин нещи, поит не гали, снегу долг. И всякие нурсовайте, а ей бы сиргу кашкас. Те ей лейкиней савайте, а я ей уси буву веноли картек савайчу буву. Ее продею жмоне скальбет, как Толомбевской лейку жидус. А их жмоне сужиною, как вьюз лейку жидус? Ну, ты по себе и по смуслу был пеньки тарней. Свети ми жмоне с кайминой ужейна. Паси слепе. Продею сяктки ки. И пирки матя катею суки берем и пирки накти. Ванденсе ее и пирки ей паси им. Вальгит. Так аз буву снегас. А паски у ей пятеек прешвеликус. Пирки нови курян. Ну ты жиду су крови и на мусан пячу. И раду тены купяли. Раду свогуну лукшти и заку голомбевской пасют с пирки кашкастой дебяна. Саку матом жибурелись в гнез и рейна жмонес и емишка. Всяк продели жмонес. Я так понял, аж нори добар опять то с каймину споклаус. Ну, юсу те вас погайляю. Резикаво, сава, шеймина, сава, байкай, тезикаво, гивибе, резикаво. Бет каймина, где я неко не резикую, кодел реке, кодел реке сект, кодел реке ишдот жмонес. Если я у кити жмонес гера дару. Ну, гера им, то и ту неко не дарай, бет у китем не трубди. Ну, а каймина, кодел. Каймина, каймина ешита. Че не каймина ешита, ве броли стик. Булеслава суситерес, жидай матит прижадею кадой, тай булеслава с атерию позбролис, рейке погайлет, ир ги суситере, ир ги спая мякаям рейкею, ир прикальбину бролис, а паске он уважавы паскомья. She said later that her father's brother denounced his brothers because years before he had been cut out of the family inheritance. So this is a local score to settle. Local collaborators turned her father and another brother into the Germans, and they were executed. And none of the Jews who were in hiding survived. So there you have a, a story about um, something that can have very bad consequences for a lot of people. And remember, a lot of these were rural communities. They were small towns. You know what that's like. Everybody knows each other's business. There are always these little petty squabbles and fights and uh, grievances. And sometimes they play out even in circumstances uh, like this. Now, the museum has also collected a few interviews with co actual collaborators. Uh, they were punished for what they did after the war and freed, and then they felt free to talk about what had happened. And so one of this uh, video is going to be a, of, um, a Lithuanian who was part of a Lithuanian battalion that went into neighboring Belarus, capital city Minsk, he's going to mention. And he's going to try to explain many years later, how he could have participated in mass shooting of men, women, and children. His name's Leon Stankus. А те юса или решки сагал как еще и лес этим давал то скорее, скорее, ну и как и было, как и те юса или. А сюда и кайрикос, че и тогда и то. Ну и рис, ну то и не крето, он сказал, че ленки, 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 ну как-то с ним все пускали, не шали, мань, что ли, то это спили, он дошел и ям, че и не говорил. Ну, 
Taip jis galvoja, kodėl kainininkai duodavo pirmų šūnų? Sako, mūsų tėvynės iš davikai. Taip. Mūsų tėvynės atpražūdė. O ką teisingai buvo, o tikrai pražūdė žydai tau lietau. Tiems komunistams. Gali tai. Tai kokie mieste buvo jūsų bažnyčia? Mėnskai, mėnskai. Rūsų bažnyčia. Tai jūs eidavote rūsų bažnyčia? Bėla rūsų buvo, bet kata lieku. Nu, mes eidavom. Jokai eidavote visą kvopą einam. Vėgink vot. A prie ko eidavote iš pažintės? Iš pažintės buvo bendra. Ir susiriai, keturi penki žmonės, ir svajok savo gailikės su savo nuodėmis, ir paskui jūs jau peržegnuo, užduoja pasimėlis tik kiek, pasimėlį, ir duos komunijų viskas. Ten jau jaus kalbėti nereikiai konigui. Tai kodėl tai padarė? Ką man atrodo, tai jaus kalbėti nereikiau. Jeigu aš šiandien nieko žiauraus nedarau, o jeigu aš žiauriai darau, tai tu man neatleisi. Tu tu teis neturi. Turi kreiptis prie dievulį už kartą. Klauktis ant kelių, mučiuoti žemelį ir prašyti vieš paties atleidimą. O tas koniks neatleis. Ačiū. Nu, paskui po karo jūs auginus vaikus, dukterį sūno auginat, ar jūs jiems pasakodėte apie tą šaudimą, kad jūs nušaudėte? Na, sakojo, nu, į viską. Kaip jūs pasakojote vaikams? Nu, sakojau, kad buvo tokie kariuomeniai, nu, teko. Buvo tokie skaudžios, nelaimės, kurie į šaudimus, žydų tautybės, teko ir man ten būti. Ir šauti prisiūrėti. Sakau, teko vienu peršauti. Nu, kavoj, ką pasiklausi, į ką jie vėl sakyti. O sako, kodėl tie vėl buvai ten į tą kariuomenį? Sako, todėl, kad aš neturėjau namų, neturėjau kur gyventi. Aš turėjau veiti kariuomenį. Aš nejau, kad specialiai, kad žydžiu šaudyti. Lietuvo savo noriu. Bet ir jums ir viskas, nu, Lietuvo savo gaigo, ne. Ne tokius darbus dėvti. O jeigu vyriausybė tą padarė, tai čia vyriausybė kalčiausiai. Taip. So, he's trying very hard to rationalize the horrible things that he did. You know, I think it could be a good discussion what responsibility he had. Okay, I've shown you an awful lot about men. What about the role of women? Um, this was a very gendered society at this time. Women played certain roles. They didn't serve in the police. They didn't serve in the army. Um, they weren't government officials. They weren't national leaders. No Angela Merkel around this time. So, but what roles did they serve in? They served as secretaries, and these are secretaries who actually worked in the Gestapo office, and one of the things that they did as part of their job was to help strip search Jewish women to make sure they weren't hiding any valuables when after they were arrested and taken away. Uh, women played this role in countries all over Europe. Uh, sometimes they used midwives for it in places like Hungary. Um, what about the role, interesting role, of the hundreds of thousands of German women who served in the East, in the Eastern Front? They, a lot of them went there because for adventure, feeling of patriotism, but a lot of them learn about the horrible things that are going on, and they're, they're witnessing them, and they become very conflicted about that and what they're heard and what some soldiers are unloading on them. What about school teachers? 
Um, we have a female school teacher in the center here. There were many in classrooms in uh, Germany, for example, who were complicit in the persecution of young Jewish students. This is Heinrich Himmler, who is the head of the SS and the German police. He's a very, very leading perpetrator. What about the role, he killed himself after the war when he was captured. What about the role of the daughters and wives and other loved ones of the perpetrators? There's been a lot of interesting research done on that lately and how these women provided emotional and psychological support to these men at the time and continuing after the war. A few women actually left their husbands because they didn't like what they were hearing what, that was going on. What about women as providers and consumers? This is an auction. This is that you can't see the person who's selling the belongings, but this is the same town that we show in the title image. And this is one month after the Jews who were in that town were taken away and literally dumped over the French border and handed over to the French authorities um, and later deported by f the French police with the help of French police to Auschwitz. But these women, one month later, and, and some men, they're really enjoying an auction of the household belongings of these Jewish residents who were taken away. Maybe they're just joy enjoying that the event is, is fun and it's a break from their ordinary routine. Or maybe they're gonna be able to get nice china or an old Singer sewing machine or something at bargain prices. Um, there's a lot of testimony about auctions like this so held not only in Germany, but in, in Eastern Europe, too. And how people had moral qualms at the time that they really didn't want to sleep in bed linings, that they, their neighbor, who had just been killed. But some people did. Some people would even approach a Jewish neighbor and say, before he's taken away, can I have your cow? We, if you don't give it to me, the Germans will get it. So this is thinking at the time. Um, what about students, though? Let's bring it down to our, our local level here. This, this is a crowd that's made large, up largely of student groups. It, some people think it's book burning or something, but that's not what it is. This is actually the burning of the furnishings of a Jewish synagogue on the night of November 9th, 10th, Kristallnacht in Germany. And teachers brought their students to these events. And sometimes they'd, they'd give them sweets to, to, in, to be witnesses to this spectacle here and to support it and to help create photographs that could be distributed for propaganda purposes. So what happened in this schoolroom is that she and her sister were not shunned as happened in many places. She tells a number of stories that are really interesting and one that I didn't show in this clip and now I can tell you since I'm summarizing it is that the mother of one of the students came up to her and said, um, my mother would not sleep with my father after she saw, she saw what he had done and he had participated in um, you know, entering someone's house and smashing the furniture and so forth, something that had happened. That, that, was, a good, that was a good story. But she's going to talk about the students who surround her lovingly and offer candy and, and fruit. So you usually don't hear those student, those kind of stories about um, what happened at that time. So I like that one because it was, it was different and it showed that people did 
have discretion to act in what we'd say today in, in the right way. They did. They, they weren't forced to always to do one thing or the other. And so the, some people did, did make good, good choices. Anyway, so I'm going to end there with that thought. And um, I hope you'll have some questions um, to ask me. I'd love to hear them. Thank you. Yes. When you, when you spoke about women, you didn't mention that there were many camp guards in Bear Canal and Ravensbrook, the women guards, right. very brutal. Also part of the T4 program. The nurses. Uh, children and uh, mentally incompetent. Women played a major role in that. Right. Yeah. I, tr I was trying to focus on some more of the complicit areas, but you're right. There were women who were very involved in killing. There was a big program um, to uh, kill uh, people with, uh, who were psychiatric patients and had mental disabilities. And there's um, a lot writ been written on um, how nurses became in involved in in, in that crime. Um, and the camp and camp guards, such as at the women's camp Robinsbrook, um, and there were trials that involved some of those guards after the, the war. Um, I, w I was trying to look at it, some of the slightly newer areas of research here, especially the um, women who served in the East and um, the relatives of the the perpetrators, which I, th I thought were interesting new angles to explore. I just wanted to say Christopher Browning's book, Ordinary Men, Women Are People, I think it's called. Ordinary Men. Deals with that issue with that person that was part of the Sunday Commando of Killing Jews, explains the whole psychology of mm. the perpetrators. Ordinary Men by Christopher Browning, an excellent book I highly recommend. Um, Oh, sure. When you appoint, you don't need to pass it. Just oh, when oh. You appointed someone All right. Okay. I read Leah Newton's book on Ravenswood. She researched it for about five years, and it was fantastic. Mm -hmm. When they came back to the United States, they tried to get the Duchess of Windsor to give money to bring these women to America and give them homes and food, and she wouldn't do it. What about some of the younger students? Have, have some questions. So questions or comments? Oh, OK. Yeah. We're just like thinking about nursing or nursing. OK. Mm -hmm. um, well, I mentioned the nurses who served with the Red Cross in Eastern Europe, and there are many, many of those. And there's a very interesting book about women who served in Eastern Europe by Elizabeth Harvey on that. Um, but there's, there's also a very, very good book on nurses who were involved in this so-called euthanasia program. Um, and it's nurses something it was published by Princeton. The author's escaping me, but I'm sure you can find it. It was based on trials that were held in Germany in the 1960s, trying to figure out, you know, how people could do this. And so it's a very interesting analysis of that. And it talked about how nurses who might have had some qualms they could be a little distant from the actual killing. Sometimes um, children were killed with injections, for example. So maybe they would only be um, uh, loading the hypodermic needle. Maybe they weren't going to be the one administering. It talked about the relationship of nurses to doctors and the kind of control that, that um, uh, they had. Um, so it's a little, you know, and I think there was a selection for these programs also. So um, I think one's political views were, were also considered. Um, for, for That was a secret program. That was supposed to be a secret program. 
so they had to rely on people, you know, not going. Of course, word got out, because the killing of uh, psychiatric patients and other people who were impaired, that happened inside Germany, in certain places inside Germany. And uh, sometimes the workers at these inst uh, killing sites, they'd go into town, they'd get drunk at night, and they'd start talking about it. Um, so they, there was the cremation of the corpses afterwards, so people would see the smoke and smell the smoke. A lot of people look at that program as kind of a tri you know, trial run for the much larger final solution to the Jewish question. They were uh, testing tech methods, because uh, these patients, there was also a gassing part of this, where patients were taken into um, gas chambers that were disguised as showers. Um, so there's some very good films on, on this, that, um, too, you know, uh, I'm, you, you may have seen. Um, OK. Yeah. Hi, I was just wondering if you uh, look at today's political climate, do you see people currently being uh, complicit towards uh, laws that can really be systemically racist? And how do you feel about that? I think it's less important what I feel but, than what you feel. But I think there, again, if being a DC and you know government employee, um, I can understand the pressures that are on some people who uh, are afraid to speak out. They want to keep keep their jobs. They have families to support, um, and they have to weigh that against maybe what they see is doing the the right thing, or they rationalize that they support some other things that are being done. So, you know. The reality is, and anyone, uh, the social psychologist here will, will be the first to say that, is, you know, people have to, um, they, they can't have too much conflict in, in, the, in their mind, in their conscience. So two things have to happen if they're conflicted about their choices and their behavior. They either have to change their behavior, or they have to rationalize what they're doing, so they're not dealing with that conflict anymore. That's just the natural thing that will happen in any situation that you're in with conflict. And an awful lot of the times, I think people start rationalizing <laughs> um, their behavior rather than changing it, um, often un with unfortunate consequences. Yes. countries that had a period of Soviet, um, you know, being a part of the Soviet Union, they have very complicated histories. But, um, uh, I, I know, because I, 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 this is one of my research areas, I know how uh, the German occupation, we shouldn't use the 
the word Nazi because it's a really uh, non-term. <laughs> it was Germany. It yeah. Was military, industrial complex, the factories. Poland was a, a colony, and in occupied Poland, um, the, Shimon Dutner, who was a, a historian, and he ran the uh, Central Commission for the Central Commission trying to translate from Poland for uh, for. Uh, investigation of German crimes in Poland, which was established in 1945. Germany waited until the 1950s. Uh, he estimated that during the first half of the war, Polish Poles, you know, the liquidations of the ghettos, and, uh, Polish Poles were dying 10 to 1 compared to Jewish Poles who were under the Judenrat in, in the ghettos. That's yeah, that. okay. Book, you know, yeah, um, it certainly our museum also commemorates Polish civilians who were killed during um, the war. Um, uh, it's, it's a complicated story. It's a very, very complicated story. And the story of collaboration and complicity also does fight against national narratives that are, that are very, very important. We, we know in this country what the, you know, that we have our own national narratives and, that may differ by depending on your political perspective, but you know it's very true for the, for the war as well. And certainly in Eastern Europe, in the uh, lands that were directly conquered and occupied by the Germans, and I did say the Germans, um, it was you could be killed for sheltering Jews. There's no doubt about it. There and there were people killed. People could be taken out of their homes and shot with their family. And it was different in a country, and that's what happened in Lithuania, by the way. We saw that. Um, in France, pe often people were not shot. They might have been sent to a concentration camp. The rule was not direct. So it, it does depend a little bit on the context, the opportunities people had. But I tried to show that even in Poland, there were a lot of temptations you know, for people to take possessions that they were supposed, I tried to show lesser situations. Um, so so it's, it's, you know, there's a range of behaviors in all these places and there's a context for those behaviors and to understand the pressures of people were under, you have to understand those contexts. It's very hard to generalize about anything. Someone in the back. idea of the range of behaviors. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just curious if in the exhibit or in your research, I know there's been some research recently looking at the people who kind of did the right thing, like if there's something you could say, is there anything that they have in common that they say sort of made them not want to be complicit or collaborate, but something that maybe encouraged yeah. them to go so against people, the flow? People always try to study that. I, I just say in general that most, a lot of the people who help Jews, they knew them. They might have been related to them. So if Jews were in um, mixed marriages and they had some non-Jewish relatives, they could be. They might have been um, employees in a firm or you know, some kind of connection. And if you think of it, if someone came and asked you for help, wouldn't you be more likely to help someone who you knew or had some contact with? We'd like to think that if anyone came to us and needed help, we'd say sure, but we know that that's generally not the case, especially when you're struggling. So that's number one. Number two, there have been studies about um, some other, uh, re look at religion. What role did that play? One of the reasons I showed that interview with that Stonkis, the collaborator, is because he talks about going to church and we're talking about a lot of people who are very religious. This was, a lot of these were very traditional societies. And you know, I could have shown a lot more about how religious leaders actually were involved in persecution and even murder of Jews. Okay, but some were not. So, so again, it, it varies. It's hard to make generalizations. I know that the upcoming special exhibit here on Le Chambon, that Protestant community in France, it's often said that um, because the Protestants were a minority in France, that uh, you know they they 
understood or, or empathized more with other religious minorities. So that, that, that's a theory, but it's also the leader of that community who had a long history of standing up for what he thought was right, including uh, being a pacifist during the First World War, which is very interesting. So it's probably a combination. It's also circumstance. You know, someone knocks on your door, you take him in, and you think you're only going to be helping him for a short period of time. You think the, the war is going to be over, and then it goes on and on and on. So it's like everything, it's complex. And you can't say, you know, simply. Um, sometimes in Germany, you know, the Catholic minority is often mentioned, and, and there were more Catholic um, there, there were situations where Catholics spoke out, but... I would also just interject from, thank you, from the psychological literature, a lot of the research afterwards was trying to see if there could be specific personality factors that you could isolate uh, for both the perpetrators and for helpers, and contrary to what we're led to believe about personality, there really aren't personality factors that necessarily predict whether you'll become a perpetrator or whether you'll become a helper. Like there were a lot of theories in the aftermath that perpetrators had underlying pathologies, psychopathy, other types of psychiatric conditions, but you know, it's very disillusioning to hear, but they were totally sane and mentally healthy. And so that tells us that it really is the power of the situation. The one thing I've been able to identify in literature reviews I've done with rescuers is a lot of times they have elevated levels of empathy and they'll say things like if I didn't help my neighbor I don't know how I would face my child or um, how I would face my wife or my husband or whatever the case is and so they didn't fall prey to that division of us versus them and they just saw kind of commonality um, among whoever was being persecuted but beyond that unfortunately we don't have a lot of those answers in terms of are there specific personality variables and like you said, there's also this kind of continuum of helping that you start with a small gesture, like letting them stay in your house for what you think is just gonna be a you know, small period of time, and then you become more and more invested in the survival, and you kind of up your helping behaviors, and before you know it, um, you become a really prominent helper or resistor within the community. So a lot of times it's like these small acts or gestures of kindness that then escalate to larger acts down the line. Yeah, and there's a lot of literature um, or some literature on doing evil and doing good. Right. And that but in both cases, often it is a progression. And, you know, even with the Holocaust, there were certain moral thresholds that were passed. Uh, one more question. Those of you who are working on assignments for the, our students, if there's any particular question that was left unanswered that might help you, don't be shy. Mm -hmm. That's what we're here for. Okay. Hello. Hi. Um, okay. Yeah, I got a question. Um, <laughs> do you only think that um, that people comply because they felt like their back was against the wall? Do did people comply only because their backs were against the wall? Um, again, it depends on the situation completely. Um, and, you know, one thing that we tried to do in the exhibition was to show that in the same situation, two individuals made different choices. To sh but that doesn't mean that both of their backs were not against the wall. What, what, what happens, you know, and again, you have to look at whether you're talking about Germany and what happened in the 1930s or what happened during the war. There are a lot of different situations in different places. But what happens in Germany after the Nazis take power is that very quickly the norms start to shift. And what was considered normal behavior and standard behavior, it, what, the definition of that changes because of the new government and people seeing which way the wind is blowing and because, you know, how. It shouldn't be that difficult to understand how norms can shift. And what was unacceptable, you know, once becomes acceptable when that happens.
because, you know, that, that's what happens. And that's probably a, a bigger factor for what happens in Germany when, you know, we shouldn't just think that every, yes, it was, um, people might have been afraid, but sometimes that's overemphasized. We're talking about shifting norms, how people start to accept this. Um, the interesting thing about Germany, though, is you know older people who grew up under different norms, they, those were the ones. But for young people, they were very, very vulnerable because they didn't know um, other ways. Anyway, thank you so much for coming. Yeah.